All right, so welcome back to our part two uh, series that we've been doing called Legacy. And we've been diving in, looking a little bit closer into uh, just last week, we talked a lot about the example of David and what he was all about, right? Uh, what was going on in his life when he, when he encountered the giant and, and how he slayed that giant in the name of God and giving glory to God allowed for him to walk in such a way that was inspiring and it inspired the nation around him. This week, we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about those giants, right? So last week, we talked about giant killers. This week, we're going to talk about killer giants. There are things that when they enter our life, they can seemingly unravel us as Christians. The most dedicated of followers can be unraveled by three things. And, and the ways of God are most unappealing and seemingly irrelevant when we are angry, when we are isolated, and when we are afraid. These three giants, man, when they come into our life, they can seem impossible to rip apart. They can seem impossible to break through. And quite honestly, if, if we're being honest with ourselves, we know that these three things have the ability to have us crash right through any moral or ethical walls that may stand up in our life. These three things, or the combination of these three things, can be big trouble for our faith and even for our community. And when we think about the last year, right, how many of us felt angry in this past year at something that you just felt like you could not get over? How about isolated? I mean, I don't know about you. I'm standing here right in the sanctuary, and I'm sure none of us have been in here for the past year. Or what about being afraid, where you're just feeling fearful? Maybe something's going to happen. Something that's out of your control is going to take place and you can't do anything about it. I'm telling you, when these three things hit, anger, isolation, and fear, these things can compel you to do anything. They can compel you to want to do something. We feel compelled to do something. And quite honestly, it's not just that we're compelled to do something. We're compelled to do anything. We will do just about anything to get rid of these feelings because these feelings in so many ways are some of the most terrifying feelings anybody can feel, right? When you are out of control and angry, you don't know what you're going to do and you're willing to do anything to get rid of it. If you're isolated and you're alone by yourself, right? You are willing to do anything and everything that is what's in your power to get yourself out of that situation. The same thing with fear. When you are afraid, your natural response kicks in. I'm going to fight or flight. And a lot of us, a lot of us, we flight. We fly out of here. We go different places and we don't know what exactly is going on in our hearts at that moment. But man, it's just pounding. Our blood pressure is rising. These three things have the power to take us apart. When we look at David's life, David was by far the best king Israel ever had, hands down. So much so that we like to say that Jesus's line comes directly from David and no one has a problem with that because David was amazing. But David had two big failures in his life. One when he was in his 50s and he, see, and he was on his balcony and he was gazing out and he sees this woman, right? And we all know the story. And then the second one is one that we don't talk about a whole lot. The second one happened when he was just in his 20s. And Saul Saul's heart towards David is starting to change. You see, David comes off of this mountain high experience of being the giant killer. And Saul is like, man, I love this guy. I want to, I, I to adopt him as my own son. And then you start seeing a lot of fellowship between David and Saul. But then at some point, for a couple of years, David is out on these missions with the, the, the army of Israel and people start singing his praises. They literally say that Saul can slay thousands, David will slay 10,000s. Basically saying that David is 10 times greater than Saul ever could ever amount to. And this starts to bother Saul. 
Saul starts to get angry. We see Saul isolate himself. And then we also see that he fears for his reputation. And those three things are going to lead Saul to do some very distasteful things. Let's go ahead and get into our Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 30. It reads, it says, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. What did we just walk into, right? What is happening in this story? Well, Saul is catching on to Jonathan. Jonathan is warning David, hey, you got to get out of town. You can't be here. You can't be in this city. My dad is trying to kill you. And Saul senses this. He knows what's going on. And so he, he comes after Jonathan. Continue reading. It says, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? What does Saul have against Je uh, uh, Jonathan's mom? He is like bringing his mom into the mix and he doesn't even need to bring her into the mix. But we're witnessing a story of a man who's unraveling. And the thing that he when, when, we, when we start to unravel, we start to point fingers. We start to bring people into narratives that we don't need to. We start to share and say that these people are doing the wrong thing. And, and, you know, we just point fingers. I can easily point fingers at my wife. Oh, well, why didn't you do this? Now all this stuff happened because you did something, right? And quite honestly, in history, I think it, it, it is pretty uh, prevalent that, that men oftentimes can blame women for the things that have happened in their lives or the things that are going on. And it goes both ways. But I think we've seen this a lot more in history, right? The king is, is, is basically blaming this guy's mom. I don't know why he's doing that. But in verse 31, it says, as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. So Saul, there's something very peculiar here because Saul, he sees David as, as the new giant. Saul sees David as someone who is in direct opposition to helping Jonathan proceed to the throne. He's like, there's no way that you will ascend if this guy David is still here. Why? Because people love him way more than they love us. Go figure. They love this guy, David. We have to get rid of him. And so... We know at this very point in this, in this story that David himself begins to flee, that he leaves the scene, that his best friend basically tells him that you can't be here. You got to get out of here. There's no way. Saul is, is on his tail. He's racing him. He's racing for him. He's looking for him. And he is really trying to kill him. He is after his very life. And there are some things that happened to David that, man, I know David just, he just panicked. But he started to feel abandoned by his closest friends, his closest relatives. He began to grow angry. And we, what we'll see is that he became afraid and he was willing to do anything when those things come together, right? So let's go ahead and get into this. First Samuel chapter 21, verse one, it says, David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? So David, he runs out of the city and he goes to the safest place that he knows. And back then Israel, it did not own the region around it, around Jerusalem. So what they did though, is that they had a center of Jewish worship where the tabernacle was, and it was placed in the safest city. And that's where you would find the priest. And so he's like, hey, why is no one with you? He is asking this question because David traveled with a thousand men. You would hear David coming from miles away, and yet he just slips into the tabernacle. And he's like, what's going on? How are you here? David answers Ahimelech the priest. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you 
on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. And we know right here and now that David is lying, that David does not have any men. And he was afraid that Ahimelech wasn't going to help him. So instead of telling Ahimelech the truth, he lies to Ahimelech. He lies to him. Continuing, it says, Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here. And so every Sabbath, the priest will bake over some bread to honor God with it. And this bread was ceremonially clean. And this bread was only supposed to be taken by the priest. This is not bread for people, for your average Joes. This is not that time. But yet David comes in and he is throwing all of the things that he is believing by the wayside because there is self-preservation settling in because of the fear and the abandonment that he is feeling in this moment. And it drives him to lie and to cross boundaries, ethical and moral boundaries that he never thought that he would cross. And yet here he is taking the consecrated bread. It's funny that there's five loaves of it too. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. And there's something to kind of be highlighted in this portion of scripture. We remember the David of Psalm 25. Last week we read this, right? In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. Whatever happened to that David? Whatever happened to that trust that he had in God? That just kind of goes to show you that we all waver at some point in time. And we're going to learn valuable examples as we continue to look into the life of David. Skipping down to verse 8, it says, David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. He's needing a weapon, right? Why do you need a weapon? In verse 9, it says, the priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Eli's here. What a coincidence. Here is this giant killer running from the giant in his life. The one that started to overcome here, overcome him, the one that made him feel fear, the one that made him feel abandoned, the one that made him feel angry. He's running from Saul and he runs right into the, the tabernacle. He's lying to the priest. He's gathering the consecrated bread for himself, crossing boundaries, tripping over himself. He's lying. And then all of a sudden there is something, a relic, if you would, from seven years ago, staring him in his face. And I just imagine this big old giant sword hanging on the wall. And Ahimelech is saying, man, the only thing I have is that thing right there. The sword you used to cut the head off of your last giant. You see, it's interesting because God oftentimes, as we are fleeing and as we are afraid, he will give us the tools that we need to destroy the giants. But those tools aren't just necessarily like these spiritual weapons that we all pull out and whatnot, but he'll, he'll, he'll make you remember what it was like to fight your last giant. He will bring you back to that place where you stood on the mount and you stood on the battle line and you yelled out to the, uh, to the armies that defied the living, the living God. You, will, you stood there and he tries to bring you back into this place. And I'm sure God is trying to bring David back. He is trying to embolden David that he's trying to help him see. Don't you see that this is just another giant? When in your life did you start to forsake me as your God? Was it the seven years of success as a general in my army? And isn't that just like us, right? Success. Last week we talked about this, right? Success can confuse the best of us. And here we have the best king who ever lived in Israel, confused about his identity before God. Let's take it back a little bit 
in 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, it says, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. What happened to this David? What happened to the boy who ran towards the battle, not away from it? These three giants have the potential to undermine our faith. Fear can undermine you. Anger can take you. And loneliness, right? You may feel lonely in your life. You may feel like somebody, anybody needs to be in this room with me because I'm afraid of being alone. I'm afraid of being angry by myself. I'm afraid of just being here. And I'm telling you right now, these things, they can cause us to run through our convictions as disciples. Fear, anger, and loneliness. Let's keep going. 1 Samuel 21, verse 9, it's, it, we're going to read it again. It says, the priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here, but that one. There is no other weapon available. No, this is the only weapon here. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. So here we have our protagonist. And he is looking at this sword that when he was a kid, he saw that same sword and he felt that he could go against it with five smooth stones. And yet he had fought so many battles since that day that now he is in this place where he is looking at the weapons that was forged against him and he's wanting to take them for himself. We have a flawed weapon, a flawed response, and a disastrous outcome. We find ourselves in this story right here, right? Where we may take that weapon that we think will help us overcome the challenges that we have in our lives. We find that weapon and we hold on to it and we, we worship that weapon. And yet we never needed that weapon. We never needed Goliath's sword to defeat Goliath. We had God who rescued us from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, and who also rescued us from the hand of the Philistine. And in our lives, we have moments like this and we wake up and we look up and we say, man, here we are. When we need God most, we run away from him and not to him. If God were with me, this wouldn't be happening to me. I'm thinking David is probably thinking this right here. That man, if, if God were with me, if God was on my side, if God didn't allow this to happen, if God didn't make this happen in my life, man, if, if God was there, I wouldn't need this sword to defend myself. I wouldn't need to take on this weapon. I wouldn't need to indulge myself into these practices. I wouldn't have to lie. I wouldn't have to steal. I wouldn't have to break through convictions and start to align myself with the world. If God were here to rescue me, I would be a different person. And therefore it is God's fault. God put me in this position. How could he put me here? It's easy to trust God when we have nothing to trust him with and nothing to trust him for. It's very easy for the little shepherd boy who was out there in the fields to trust God. But as he continued to mature and an and, and adult, there was something that came after him. And I think it was his own success, his own prowess that God gave him. And this was one of his biggest Mistakes. We're going to get into it. First Samuel 22, verse 10, it says, Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of, of Goliath, the Philistine. 
Then the king sent for the son, Ahimelech, son of Atub, and all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. And Himelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family. For your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said, you will surely die, Ahimelech, and your whole family. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priest of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. You see, when we are ran by these three things, it causes us to do just about anything without regard for anyone else around us. They become casualties to our sin, casualties to our fear, casualties to our anger, casualties to our own loneliness. And this is David's biggest regret. We see in verse 22, that he is talking to one of the sons of Ahimelech who escaped and he says, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. That is crazy. A couple of moves that, you know, you were driven by your fear, so it led you to feel this way. It led you to go to this place. It led you to lie, and it just kind of just got out of control, right? That's what sin does to us. That's what these things they do to us. They just kind of snowball out of control. And they snowball in such a way that David, the casualties were unassuming priests in an unassuming town who were just wanting to obey God. They just wanted to do what was right. And he took advantage of that. I think this is probably one of his biggest regrets. If David was sitting here, we were interviewing him, we asked him, what, are your, what, are you, what is one of your biggest regrets? And I bet it was this moment when he forgot about who to put his trust in. This moment. You know, what is your anger, loneliness, or fear causing you to consider that you've never considered before? Who is your anger and your loneliness and your fear causing you to consider that you never considered before? What besides you does your considerations put at risk? When you consider all of the things that David considers, right? What besides yourself does your considerations put at risk? Your moral failures or, 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 or that, that line you might have crossed, right? Who else is at risk? What else is at risk when you blow right past and into those places? I could tell you right now, to be honest, that Whenever I blow it in my anger, I know I can feel it that I'm putting my wife and my children at risk. That they are at risk of being just another story, right? I've heard so many of them where the young men will tell, tell the story that their father was just an angry man and that he would snap and he would just go off the rails. And those are the things that led up to my, my kids feeling the way that they do about the church, they do about the kingdom, the, 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 the people of God. I know for a fact that that's what I do. My fear, whenever I get fearful, 
I know that I'm, I'm putting a lot of people at risk. I could put the whole congregation at risk if my fear gets out of hand, if I allow fear to subdue me. And if I ever felt lonely, that could easily put my, my, my marriage at risk. There are things that if we consider and we allow to take hold of us, we will start to consider things that we never should consider and they will derail our entire story. You no longer are, that, are, are the king of example, but now we are people who leave less to be desired when it comes to looking at their examples. We're almost done. Let's, let's, let's kind of finish and close this out. You know, what advice would you give somebody who is where you are? If you could look back or if you could kind of remove yourself from the situation, what would you tell yourself where you are right now? How would you advise yourself? How would you help yourself? If you see someone that is consumed with these things, how would you help them? Those answers oftentimes are the same way you need to help yourself or get some help. In Psalms 9, verse 9, we find this very comforting passage. It says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, the Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. We see in Matthew 11, verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We know as disciples that our hearts, when it gets to this place, we need to return to Jesus. We are tired from the day's journey. We are exhausted from the lies and from the abandonment. We are exhausted from the anger and the loneliness. We're exhausted and the world is, is crashing down around us. But Jesus himself comes and he tells us this incredible news. And he says, hey, look, give me your bags. Give me your bags. I got you. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. Give me your burdens. Come into my refuge, come into my shelter, and I will defeat those giants for you. I will take a hold of your fear and toss it by the, by the wayside. I will give you my trust. I will help you and give you my power. I will strengthen you. I will harden you and help you become the, the man of God, the woman of God that you need to become, that you want to become, right? Jesus here is offering us all of this. And we know that this is to be true. Many of us need to return to God in this way. Many of us have to help others return to God in this way. I know that there are so many people in the congregation right now where you stand, you may stand in the most faithful place that you've ever been in your walk with God, but you can relate to the story that you're hearing about David and how he cost an entire man and his family everything because of the decisions he made, because of the boundaries he crossed. And you can relate to that. And that story needs to be shared for those to have hope in God, to know that, that they're not just broken, that they can't be pieced back together by the Spirit of God, but that everything, when brought to Jesus, can be healed. Everything, when brought to Jesus, can be fixed. Because He is the author and the perfecter of faith. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, it continues, says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your very souls. Right? Psalms 9, 9, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Jesus, God, the Spirit, are all working in unison to be a hedge around you to be your rescue, to be your safe place, 
to be the one that rescues you from everything that is going on around you in your life at this very moment. Maybe you're feeling all these different emotions. Maybe you're feeling depressed. Maybe you're feeling scared. Maybe you're feeling angry. Maybe you're feeling alone. Maybe you're feeling, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. All the things that you're feeling and God is saying, I have the answer for it. I can rescue you from it. I've rescued many from Paul's. I've rescued many from hands of men. I have rescued many and I've saved many. I can surely save you, but please give me your bags. Give me the bags. I just want your bags. I just want your burden so that you can lean on me. Like like he wanted Israel, right? He wanted Israel. In all the stories that we know about Israel, he wanted them to lean on God, not necessarily want a king. No matter how awesome and amazing the kings are, even when we look at the story of David, no matter how great these kings are, they are always flawed on some level and they need Jesus. In closing, I want to ask you, what is one area of your life in which you are tempted to rely on your own talents, your own skills and ingenuity rather than on God? And what stands in the way of you you relying on your heavenly father in that area? I know as the family of God, we can do better in depending more and more on Christ. Let us put ourselves into that position and let us follow Jesus. You guys have a beautiful Sunday. I pray and I hope that as you are building your legacy, that it is filled with more examples of what to do than it is of things not to do like our friend David. You guys have a great Sunday. Have a great week. I'll see you guys next week. Take care.